All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, let's get started. So uh, today I'm thrilled that we have Jeff Bauer visiting us virtually uh, to talk about the recent results of the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, the very first images of our Milky Way's black hole, Sag A star. Um, these results are fresh off the press, less than a week old, uh, with the collaboration releasing the image and uh, scientific interpretations in the simultaneous press conferences around the world just last Thursday. And um, as I'm sure Jeff will mention, uh, getting this result took a lot of time, <laughs> took over two and a half years of solid focus work on the, on the data, literally years of tests to get where we felt confident enough to release the results uh, with everyone. And this was the result of you know, work of many people, um, but our fearless leader throughout the whole process was really Jeff. You know, Jeff kept us going, it kept our spirits high enough uh, to keep plowing forward. Uh, so yeah, we're all eternally grateful to him for that. Um, and I, I want to uh, introduce Jeff more formally, but before doing that, I want to highlight uh, that this um, picture was the result of over 300 people from around the world, but some of these key contributions came from right here at Caltech. Um, so in particular, I want to highlight three Caltechers who did incredible work uh, that the result wouldn't have been possible without. Um, first is Ha Sun. Uh, ha um, was a postdoc in CMS who only left campus back at the end of March, and he's now starting a faculty position at Peking. Um, and Ha Sun worked on both imaging and modeling, but primarily focused on geometric modeling of the data. So once we felt uh, confident that this ring structure was likely, he used a method that he developed while here at Caltech. Uh, that we call deep probabilistic inference or DPI uh, to analyze the posterior distribution of different features uh, of that crescent shape. Uh, for instance, like things like the ring's diameter, the position angle, the width. Uh, and Ha also used this method to analyze minute to minute variations of Sag star to see if we could pull out any kind of trends on minute time scales. Um, second, who I want to highlight is Aviad Levis. Aviad is currently a postdoc in CMS working on physics-based inverse imaging problems. And Aviad helped out with many different parts of the imaging pipeline um, that was used to reconstruct the Sag star image. But his primary role in the project was being the sub-team coordinator of the synthetic data team. So his role on the team was really to design a set of synthetic data that would allow us to reliably train and test our imaging methods and make sure that we weren't just re reconstructing rings by accident. Um, and one particular improvement that he added was uh, the dynamics model that allowed us to mimic variability on time scales, uh, the variability kind of that we observe in Sag A star in our own synthetic data we tested with. Um, and then last but not least, um, Junhan King. Junhan is currently a postdoc in astronomy here at Caltech. And during his PhD and into his postdoc, Junhan uh, helped to commission a number of telescopes used uh, by the EHT. In particular, Junhan made countless trips to the South Pole to help get it ready to observe the Sag A star data. And as I'm sure uh, many of you know, the South Pole telescope was incredibly important in probing the high spatial frequencies we need to recover uh, the image. I also want to note that these the images that the EHT collaboration has released of M87 star and Sag A star are you know, not the end, but really the beginning. And to that end, uh, Caltech is also helping with the future of the EHT as well. In particular, I want to highlight Vikram Ravi and Nitika Yadlapali. So Vikram is uh, leading the charge on adding the 10 meter telescope at Overo, uh, you see here on the right to the EHT array. And this will allow us to fill in some very in short, uh, important short baselines that will help us get higher dynamic range images and also allow us to connect the ring to the jet structure in the future. Um, and so hopefully the overall telescope will begin to observe with the EHT in 2024. Um, and then Nitika, who is a graduate student, is also helping to commission the telescope. But in addition to that, she's um, been getting into the imaging side of the project, helping out with imaging 2018 data we've collected. And she's been leading the charge on getting one of the imaging pipelines up and running and uh, really excited to continue working with her on that. So huge thank you to our Caltech team, uh, both who worked on the Sag A star data and also the, for the future of the telescope. Um, but without much more ado, I'd like to introduce Jeff Bauer. Um, Jeff is the project scientist for the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, or as I said, fearless leader. Um, he's also the chief scientist for Hawaii operations with the Academia um, Sintica Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics and affiliate graduate faculty with the University of Hawaii, um, Manoa Physics and Astronomy. 
And Jeff is a graduate of Princeton uh, and Berkeley, and he also held research and teaching positions at Berkeley NRAO and the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. Um, his interests are in black holes, neutron stars, uh, the dynamic radio sky, and radio astronomy instrumentation. And so with that, we're very excited to have you here, Jeff. Um, please take it away. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let me get the screen sharing going here. Okay, does that look good? Looks great. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the great introduction, Katie, and uh, for the uh, the invitation to uh, uh, to uh, give this talk. Uh, I'm giving it remotely, as uh, as you know, of course. Uh, uh, while I'm here at the Black Hole Institute uh, this week uh, in Cambridge, um, uh, and uh, Katie's right to uh, to emphasize the uh, uh, the contributions of of current Caltechers uh, 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 sprinkled throughout this talk. I, I have a uh, a few uh, 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 recognitions of, of past contributions to, uh, to this work from, uh, from Caltechers uh, uh, that uh, really spanning uh, decades, because this, this truly is a, a result that, uh, um, that, that has been in the making for really 50 years or almost 50 years uh, since the discovery uh, of Sag A star uh, in 1974. So uh, you've already seen the main result, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, it's pretty much unavoidable. Uh, but, uh, you know, on the left, you see the, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope image of, uh, of M87. And on the right, you see the, uh, the EHT image um, of Sag A star, which we released last week. And uh, there are uh, six collaboration papers uh, in AppJ App letters that uh, uh, we hope you'll take the time to look at. They really represent that work of uh, hundreds of, uh, of people uh, over many years. Uh, so here's M87. Uh, this should be fairly familiar to, to most of you at this point. Uh, the first image of a black hole uh, and of course, the really salient feature here is the diameter. It's a ring. It's with a diameter of 42 micro arc seconds, and that corresponds to uh, a black hole mass of 6.5 billion solar masses, uh, with about a 10% uh, uncertainty uh, on that mass. Now, Sag A star is. Uh, 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 slightly larger, 52 micro arc seconds in diameter, so about 20 micro arc seconds in diameter, but effectively uh, uh, very close uh, in, uh, in diameter. Um, but it is uh, uh, almost a factor of uh, 1600 less uh, in mass uh, and uh, around 4 million solar masses uh, that uh, uh, as, as uh, contained within this ring and as, as shown here. So I'm gonna tell you uh, about the galactic center, uh, about the, the, the path to making this image, uh, and then the path towards uh, interpreting it uh, and, uh, and uh, what we've learned from it, and then what we hope to be able to do in the future uh, uh, with, with, with more observations and deeper analysis. Um, this result, of course, is uh, the, the M87 result first, and uh, the Sag A star result is the, the result that launched a thousand memes. Um, and, and really, I think one of the most satisfying is the XKCD uh, uh, cartoon, uh, not only because of its cultural currency, uh, but because how informative it is, right? That uh, um, the uh, showing the, uh, the physical diameter of the ring uh, as comparable to the uh, the diameter of the outer solar system, the ring for uh, for Sag A star is uh, considerably smaller, sixteen hundred times smaller, more like the uh, the the uh, uh, the orbital radius uh, of, uh, of Mercury uh, rather than the than the outer solar system. Um, I will note uh, that uh, uh, one of the one of the 
Uh, one of the side benefits uh, uh, that came out with, with our result announced last week was that Krispy Kreme gave away uh, free donuts. And I think that's a, a sure sign that uh, astronomy really does have uh, value in the real world. Okay. Um, as Katie said, uh, this is uh, the result of uh, uh, hundreds of people working over as a part of the EHT over the last uh, seven years uh, since the EHT was, was formed as, as an organization. This is the last time that the EHT was actually met in person. Uh, about 120 of our members came to, uh, came to Hawaii for, uh, uh, for our collaboration meeting. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, over the last two and a half years, this is how we've actually been operating, right? Is holding virtual collaboration meetings. And you can see many of the, the, the people here. Uh, I will say that that has been a, that was a fairly substantial challenge to, uh, to completing this work. Uh, but, uh, uh, and we are really looking forward to the opportunity to be able to work to, uh, in person together and solve problems together. Um, so the fundamental motivation for, um, uh, for the Event Horizon Telescope uh, is revealed in this plot or the fundamental just technical justification for this. So on the, on the x-axis, you have the, uh, uh, the angular resolution or the resolution of the sources uh, better resolution uh, goes to the left, which maybe seems a little backwards. Um, and, uh, and then we have the, uh, the brightness uh, of, the, uh, of the sources. And only Sag A star and M87 have uh, projected angular diameters on the sky that are large enough uh, to be observed from the ground at wavelengths of around one millimeter and actually resolved. Uh, the shadow diameter is predicted by theory, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment, but it's about 10 times the gravitational radius. For M87, that was initially predi predicted to fall between 20 and 40 micro arc seconds. And for Sag A star, it's predicted to fall uh, at, uh, at about 50 micro arc seconds. In addition to uh, being resolvable, these two sources uh, are also uh, two of the brightest uh, compact radio sources on the sky at these wavelengths, uh, which, uh, which makes them feasible for this uh, very challenging set of observations. There are a handful of other targets that we look at. We look at blazars, and we're starting to look at uh, some other low luminosity AGN, but none of the other sources uh, are within the range of, uh, of having their shadow or their event horizon resolved by these observations. Ah, so I was informed today uh, uh, by Todd Lauer. Todd said, you really have to tell the people at, or remind everyone at Caltech about uh, the, the role that Wall Sargent played uh, uh, in, uh, in the late 70s uh, with the first uh, mass measurement of, uh, uh, of M87 from, uh, um, from stellar uh, spectroscopy, and so here's here's Wall uh, in front of uh, in front of Palomar, and of course that's part of what uh, uh, a long history of making these uh, these measurements uh, of of black hole masses using stellar techniques and gas dynamic techniques uh, that's been uh, uh, quite important for feeding into to this work. So the, the shadow feature uh, was uh, for Sag A star was predicted more than two decades ago in this paper by Falca, Melia, and Agal. Uh, and uh, they took a very simple uh, model uh, of uh, just a ball of uh, an optically thin emitting gas surrounding the black hole and showed under a variety of, uh, 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 of different types of calculations and circumstances that you uh, that that the uh, just using ray tracing uh, of the the light uh, originating close to the black hole that you produce this uh, this this shadow feature, uh, and that has held up uh, over time. 
uh, and I'll show in a moment some the, the, the very advanced simulations of this. But that calculation has its roots, uh, going back to Bardeen, uh, who calculated the, the, uh, the shadow diameter, which is essentially a, an, an impact parameter for, uh, for photons coming into the, uh, uh, the photon ring, uh, the ring at which photons orbit the black hole. Um, and this has this characteristic value uh, of around 10 gravitational uh, 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 radii. Um, there was, uh, there was a, a, an early simulation of, a, of an image that Lumine did in the late 70s that's shown here on the right. I love to show this because this was a numerical simulation done using, the, using computers, but the, the, the visualization here is a drawing by hand made based on the that simulation. Uh, and you can see, of course, the resemblance to, uh, uh, to what uh, uh, was we've observed and what was predicted later on. Of course, simulations have grown much more sophisticated uh, in, uh, uh, in the ensuing decades. And this is a great example from C.K. Chan at the University of Arizona showing uh, accretion, uh, jet launching, uh, and uh, you can see that there is a persistent feature uh, of the uh, uh, of the shadow of the the black hole or the the photon ring uh, that's uh, that's present uh, in all of these cases uh, from radio, millimeter, uh, infrared, and uh, and X ray. What's really important. Uh, is that uh, is that it's optically thin uh, as you uh, as you look towards um, the, uh, the the black hole. So the predictions have been there. Um, actually achieving this, however, has been a major experimental uh, effort. Um, we need to achieve an angular resolution with a wave with a resolution of about twenty micro arc seconds in order to resolve these features. So we need a global millimeter VOBI array to do this um, with a one millimeter uh, wavelength and uh, earth diameter baseline, you get a 20 micro arc second resolution, but there's no existing array that does this. So we had to build our own network out of the existing millimeter, submillimeter facilities in order to uh, uh, in order to uh, be able to, uh, to carry this out. Um, each of those facilities is in one of the most unique places uh, on earth because uh, millimeter wavelength radiation, of course, is uh, very heavily absorbed uh, uh, by water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, and so we use a narrow window uh, in that at 230 gigahertz. Uh, where the absorption is less, uh, but, uh, but again, you need to be above most of the water vapor. And then of course, water vapor in the atmosphere as it moves uh, across the, uh, the antenna beam uh, introduces path length delays, uh, which, uh, which corrupt the coherence of the interferometer. And those, the time scales for those changes are a few seconds to tens of seconds. So that means that we have to be able to, uh, uh, to detect uh, our source on any given baseline uh, on that coherence time scale, a few seconds, maybe tens of seconds. Um, and so there, we're, we're really very constrained to only the brightest sources that, that we can observe. Uh, just as an example of one of the great sites for carrying this out is the summit of Mauna Kea. Uh, you see the submillimeter array as, uh, as one of our facilities. There. Uh, we also have the JCMT uh, on, uh, on Mauna Kea as well. Now, so to overcome that sensitivity challenge due to the coherence limit, um, there are a couple of major steps that, uh, that we have to take or that we take. Uh, and uh, the, uh, one of the really big steps and in innovations that the, that the collaboration led uh, or played a major role in was going to very high bandwidth uh, recording. So 
recording of VLBI data has followed something like Moore's law or a version of Moore's law beginning, uh, you know, with its humble beginnings at less than a megabit per second in the in the uh, uh, in the late 1960s when recording began on reel-to-reel -reel systems. Uh, when I first started uh, doing field BI in the uh, in the mid 1990s, we were working at a uh, uh, hundred or maybe two hundred megabits per second. The VO, the EHT now is recording data at uh, uh, sixty four gigabits per second, and we have plans to to go beyond that. Uh, we record on these giant banks of. Uh, uh, of, of disks uh, and write to a large number of disks uh, simultaneously in order to get this very high data rate. Higher data rate means more bits, so it means we're able to integrate down the noise um, uh, more rapidly uh, and have more instantaneous sensitivity. And of course, the other uh, key direction uh, for sensitivity has been the introduction uh, of more antennas and more sensitive antennas. And ALMA, of course, has really been central to that as the largest submillimeter telescope by a very significant amount. Uh, ALMA really serves as a sensitivity anchor uh, for, the, uh, for the entire uh, array. Uh, so here you see all the facilities that participated in the 2017 observations which produce both the M87 and SAG A star uh, observations that, uh, uh, or images that uh, you, uh, uh, that I, I showed you at the beginning. Um, and so this, and you can also see that we do span all the way, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in two dimensions uh, in, uh, uh, the 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 longest baselines, or nearly the longest baselines that are that are possible, from Hawaii to Spain, and from Hawaii and Spain uh, to the uh, to the South Pole. Um, this is I want I really want to emphasize the experimental nature, especially in two thousand seventeen uh, of these experiments. Uh, uh, Katie's credit, uh, Junhan, uh, for all of his efforts at the South Pole is, uh, is absolutely a, 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 a well, well, well chosen because of the enormous effort that has to, has to go in at each, each site uh, to have a team of experts on hand for all the different subsystems and ex, uh, axes uh, of carrying out these, uh, these observations. We're getting much better at this and we're training local observatory staff so that uh, in the future uh, we, uh, or well, currently it requires far less, uh, local expertise than we previously had. And we hope for that to continue to grow in the future to make these observations more turnkey. Uh, but certainly for, uh, for these observations in 2017 required a large number of people on site uh, dedicated to carrying these out. Okay, so let me turn to the Galactic Center uh, at this point um, and, uh, uh, and talk to you uh, about what's special about the Galactic Center, what's special about SAG star and what we've learned from it. So um, the Galactic Center, of course, is the kitchen sink of the, of the galaxy. Absolutely every phenomenon that you can think of takes place there. SAG star sits inside the, the Milky Way uh, cluster of um, uh, of stars, uh, and uh, of course the study of uh, of those stars in the central arc second uh, led to the Nobel Prize for Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez a couple of years ago. And fundamentally, uh, right, the uh, those stellar astrometric measurements followed the motions of, um, of stars around Sag A star, and in particular, the star known as S2, uh, which, was on a, which is on a 15 year highly elliptical orbit around Sag A star. And they have provided uh, an exquisite uh, measurement of the mass and the distance uh, to, uh, to Sag A star 
So 4 million solar masses, eight kiloparsecs, uh, and with precision better than 1% in each of those quantities. And of course, for predicting the, uh, the diameter of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the shadow feature for Sag A star, the key uh, parameter is mass over distance. Uh, and uh, we plot that for both the, the VLT uh, and Keck results, and you can see that they are very precise, but they, there are systematic differences between these two measurements. Uh, and so there is some remaining uncertainty there, but that uncertainty, it turns out, is, is much smaller than the precision which, uh, which we're able to obtain with our current observations. Um, but importantly, that precision is much, much better than the uh, agreement in the mass of M87, where prior to our observations, there were stellar and gas dynamic uh, 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 measurements that differed by a factor of two uh, in their estimate of, of the black hole mass. Uh, and so we really think the combination of the stellar astrometry and the EHT measurements with their two precisions uh, really puts us in a, in a regime where we can make much stronger tests uh, of, uh, uh, of the astrophysics and of the uh, general relativity and black hole physics. Okay, so that's the optical infrared view of the galactic center. Here's the radio view of the galactic center. Uh, we're going in through the galactic plane. We're going down, here's the VLA image showing uh, Sag A East, a massive supernova explosion, young supernova explosion. That compact dot that you see in there, that is Sag A star buried uh, uh, next to the so-called mini spiral, which is gas flowing in towards, towards Sag A star. Uh, and of course, there's that, that image. Let me play that again, uh, just because I, I like for people to be able to see all of the kind of complex uh, structure that exists um, in that region uh, and uh, some of the, uh, you know, that Sag A star is not dominant uh, in, uh, in this view, right? It's you, one has, to, one has to search quite hard in order to find it in all of this, uh, but it is quite unique in its compactness. There are no other features that are compact uh, in the way that uh, the way that Sag A star is. Ah, so, okay, so here's my next bit of, uh, of Caltech contributions. So uh, early on in the history of Sag A star, uh, uh, the Owens Valley and Goldstone antennas uh, played a, a, a major role uh, in uh, the detection of, uh, uh, of Sag A star as a compact radio source. This was work led by, uh, by Fred Lowe uh, and uh, an early field BI experiment that uh, gave a compact size uh, uh, for Sag A star of less than 20 milli arc seconds uh, and which uh, was uh, uh, following on the, the, the work from by Balick and Brown, uh, which uh, placed a, a similar constraint only a, a little bit uh, earlier. And you can see that uh, in addition, there were uh, uh, efforts on, on M87 and Centaurus A and Cygnus A. Centaurus A and M87, of course, being uh, other EHT uh, targets. And here's the other, uh, uh, another major contribution from Caltech. Uh, so this is the beginning of uh, millimeter VLBI, kind of proto, VL, uh, proto EHT observations that were carried out in the late 2000s. And uh, the KARMA array uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Owens Valley or above the Owens Valley uh, was one of three stations that contributed to, uh, to these measurements, which set uh, the, uh, a size constraint of a few Schwarzschild radii 
uh, on the uh, on the diameter of uh, of of Sag A star. Um, now, so for those of you who are not in interferometrists, um, what we're plotting here on the left is uh, the visibility amplitude as a function of baseline length. The visibilities uh, are, the, uh, are the Fourier transform of the sky brightness distribution. Um, and so a, a point source, uh, the, the, for a point source, the visibility amplitudes are flat with baseline length. It's the Fourier transform of a delta function. Here we modeled uh, the visibilities as a uh, as a Gaussian source on the sky, which for a transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian, uh, and uh, and that's at the characteristic size. You can the dashed curve uh, was a uh, was a ring model uh, that uh, that that we uh, applied, but uh, at the time certainly did not argue. Uh, that that was uh, that was actually evidence for the existence of a, of, of a ring in 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 those data. So this data very far from uh, being able to produce produce something that that looks like an image. Up until uh, last week, the the state of the art for imaging Sag A star um, was at slightly longer wavelengths, at a wavelength of three millimeters. This is a result from the VLBA uh, plus ALMA and the GBT at three millimeters. And at three millimeters, Sag A star is a fuzzy blob. And in fact, it's a fuzzy blob uh, at all wavelengths, three millimeters and longer, as the result of uh, strong interstellar scattering uh, by uh, plasma, turbulent plasma along the line of sight, which has this characteristic lambda squared uh, uh, size dependence uh, that uh, that has been very well characterized uh, over the years uh, from the longest wavelengths we can see Sag A star at uh, all the way down to one millimeter, and you can see where that 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 at one millimeter and three millimeter, and even all the way out to one centimeter, uh, we start to see divergence from this lambda squared law. That's our our indication that we're detecting intrinsic structure here, uh, but we're not able to see the shadow. We're not able to, to look for jets in a, in, a, in a strong way in this data. Um, and so one millimeter is a really motivating wavelength to work at because the scattering becomes significantly reduced. Um, oh, so this is just a diagram illustrating that concept. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly straight, uh, uh, of how the, 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 the scattering works. Uh, and it affects both pulsars uh, and introduces time delays or time broadening for pulsar signals and introduces temporal or angular broadening uh, for, uh, for steady sources like, uh, like Sag A star. So this is the, the UV coverage, the visibility plane coverage uh, for these observations. Uh, and you can see uh, that although we still have a relatively small number of antennas, we're actually filling in this space reasonably well. Uh, and this uh, UV coverage really, um, you know, gives us the confidence that, that we are able to, uh, uh, to make images in this data. So this is the visible, and this is the corresponding visibility amplitude plot uh, for Sag A star much richer, of course, than what we had 15 years ago. Um, and the, uh, there are a few really salient features here to see. We see the, the initial uh, uh, de decrease. We see the presence of uh, two minima uh, or nulls uh, in, the, uh, in the visibility amplitude. Um, and this, uh, this gray dashed line is, uh, a, uh, a, a simple model that we, that is not fit to this data, but of a, of a, a, a ring with a, a, a certain thickness and a diameter of 54 micro arc seconds, which just to I fits the, the overall profile uh, uh, of this data, but you can see it doesn't fit it exactly. And in particular, uh, looking at, 
at, at this, the location of the first null, you can see that some baselines, so on a cert, some orientations, uh, we don't get a null in that direction and in, uh, in others we do. In M87, we saw something similar, which we took as the uh, clear evidence for asymmetry. Situation with Sag A star is, is a little bit more complex and I'll go into that uh, at, at this point. So we've talked about scattering and how that uh, affects uh, our data. It turns out that we, we, we put a lot of care into testing the impact of scattering on our data. And it turns out not to have played a very significant limiting role in the measurements. On the other hand, temporal variation is a really critical uh, uh, issue for us to resolve. During the course of our observations, the flux density of Sag A star uh, oscillated significantly, about 10% uh, variation. Between two consecutive days, we can see that the closure phases have changed uh, significantly on the same triangle. So we have a very good sense that, uh, um, that there are intrinsic structural changes happening on that, on that time scale. Um, and then, uh, oh, well, I'll just show you the little movie here of Sag A star flickering uh, uh, on, uh, on the April 7th. Um, we also uh, uh, saw on April 11th data, which we have not yet uh, uh, published. We saw actually quite significant, uh, much more significant change in the, um, uh, uh, in the flux density following uh, an X-ray flare. So stay tuned, that's data that we're working on and we hope to, uh, to have out to the community soon. Um, so the, there, are, there are two concerns when we think about what to do about the, um, uh, 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 about the variability. One is that we can just divide out this total intensity variation. But we think, and we have, uh, evidence in the data for that there is structural variation that's taking place uh, as well. The whole thing is not just brightening or, or fading. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's changing in structure. So here's a, and this is a, 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 a demonstration of, of the approach that we took to this of decomposing uh, the, the problem into both a static and a time variable uh, component. Um, and that's, that was the, uh, the image domain, uh, this seizure inducing uh, uh, movie is, the, uh, is in the visibility domain. But what we do with that is we, we that, that allows us to, um, uh, both by looking at simulations and by looking at the data themselves, essentially to, um, to introduce a, a a weighting scheme for our interferometric data um, that, uh, that treats the, uh, the, the actual variations in the data appropriately so that we can construct one static uh, image of the data that is consistent with the, um, uh, uh, with, the, um, with the variability but does not actually recover uh, the, uh, the variability. So that, uh, that methodology goes into the images that we made. We also used what we call snapshot imaging. So making images on very short time scales uh, and doing modeling on very short time scales. That's quite challenging because there we're back in this regime with very limited UV coverage and a difficulty of, of um, uh, of, of just very incomplete information for making an image or a model. So um, this this is I, I really want to give Katie a lot of uh, a lot of credit here. This is the you know the the imaging team uh, that we had within the the collaboration uh, used multiple methods that you can see here. Looked at two different days. Looked at the effect of. Uh, with and without scattering, and use two different uh, 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 fringe fitting uh, techniques uh, or pipelines. Uh, and you can see that consistently across all these methods, 
that we uh, obtain uh, ring images uh, that uh, of the of a comparable diameter. Uh, uh, but uh, if you look in detail at the uh, at 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 individual uh, structures in these, those do appear to vary across the methodologies and across the uh, the, the pipelines uh, and data sets, and that sets a uh, a real limit to the the degree to which we think it's reasonable to interpret uh, these um, these data. And specifically, we really stay away from saying there's one particular image that uh, um, that uh, that that is the, the 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 true image in the way that we did for M87. Uh, and so we use a number of algorithms for clustering the, the ensemble of images that we generate. And uh, you can see that nearly all of the images that are generated fall into ring-like images, but with different intrinsic features. But there are uh, a few percent uh, that fall into uh, non-ring regimes, still with this kind of characteristic scale of uh, you know, 50 micro arc seconds. Um, embedded in them, but nevertheless non-ring-like. Um, so that is a minor caveat, I think, on the, the overall result. Um, we also do modeling. So imaging, of course, is put all the data into the image domain, and we do it in, in, in a number of different ways. We also do modeling where we uh, assume geometric models, rings, crescents, uh, and, uh, and, and fit data that way. Uh, we also do a model the data without, um, with non-ring-like models, uh, and you can see uh, in this law in this likelihood plot, uh, all the symbols with O's are ring-like models, uh, and all the ones with X's are non-ring-like models. All the ring-like, uh, the best fitting models are ring-like. The the uh, non-ring-like models uh, are. Uh, um, uh, are, are, are not good fits. Um, so we get about a, uh, uh, we get this final measurement, 52 plus or minus two micro arc seconds. Uh, so that's a few percent uh, uncertainty uh, on the ring diameter that we, uh, that we measure. Uh, but then we have to, uh, we have to, to translate that ring diameter into a statement about the shadow diameter, which is a, uh, which is connected directly to the uh, uh, to GM uh, over C DC squared. Uh, we have to calibrate these measurements against the astrophysics that goes into this. Right, um, there's a whole suite of uh, 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 of astrophysical models, uh, which I'll show you more detail on. And those set the dominant degree of uncertainty on the mass uh, that we can associate with, with this ring measurement. So we estimate a mass with a, about 15 to 25% uncertainty uh, on the mass. And that's completely dominated uh, by our overall lack of constraint uh, on those uh, the the, the astrophysical models uh, of, uh, uh, of the gas. Now, I want to, so at this point, I'm going to turn towards the interpretation of those models, but I want to give you a sense of the whole range of models that we explored. This is really one of the most complete sets of, um, uh, uh, of, of GRMHD models that have been done for systems of this kind. You can see we explored inclination angles, spin uh, in uh, uh, different spin orientations. Um, uh, the R high parameter is a measure of the um, ratio of the electron to proton temperature. Um, and then MAD and SANE uh, are these uh, Different uh, well, MAD is magnetically arrested uh, accretion, and SANE is the um, standard and normal. And these uh, essentially account for different uh, magnetic field strengths. And then these are all time domain models, so we're exploring them over different times. Uh, 
there's also some additional types of models looking at non-thermal emission, non-thermal particle distributions, tilted disks, and some other models. Um, and so then in order to try to constrain the astrophysics, uh, we took a number of constraints and, uh, and then cut away the, the various possible uh, models that, uh, that could exist. And in particular, the, the, the ring uh, diameter and width and the degree of azimuthal um, uh, smoothness that we can infer uh, was quite powerful uh, in constricting the size. And you can see the, the role that some of the other uh, uh, constraints actually, um, actually played. One of the really remarkable uh, results from this is that actually none of the, uh, uh, of the many, many models that we considered actually passed all of the, the, uh, the data constraints that we placed on them. And in particular, variability uh, was, uh, was one of the constraints that uh, the models, for whatever reason, uh, appear to be too variable relative to, uh, to the data. That's a really exciting domain, I think, for the people in our theory teams to, uh, to work on. Um, but generally, I think that the, the most robust conclusion is, is, is that we really pretty strongly reject um, uh, high temperature, high electron temperature models and edge on models. Uh, other, other constraints are, are, are a little bit uh, broader. Okay, let me turn now to uh, the interpretation in uh, black hole physics and with respect to, uh, to general relativity. Um, so this is a, 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 a characteristic parameter space plot that's often used for uh, uh, tests of, of, of gravity, the gravitational potential versus the curvature. Uh, LIGO measurements live up here at uh, very high uh, curvature and very high potential. EHT measurements are high potential, not quite as large a curvature. You know, solar system measurements that are, uh, that are in this regime, cosmology measurements sample this space. And of course, there's also, um, there's also the parameter space of um, you know, which parts of the, the, the metric, the stationary or dynamic metric, different tests uh, approach. And so all of these, you know, our measurements are a part of this overall puzzle of, uh, of, of how we understand uh, constraints uh, on, on gravity. I think one of the really, uh, one of the truly unique kinds of tests that we're able to do with the EHT is to place constraints on whether an event horizon is present and what its properties are. In particular, um, we can reject uh, uh, a hard surface or an absorbing uh, event horizon based on the fact that as material would accrete onto that, it would heat up. And our measurements give a, give a size then for that to radiate would produce too much uh, emission uh, in the, uh, the X-ray. Uh, against the known spectrum. Um, that's an that's a older result that we've improved on with this. We also have a new result where we explore whether or not event horizons can be reflecting. Uh, and that relies more on the morphology uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the image that we achieve. Uh, and we can place, a, 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 at this point, I would say a weak constraint on the albedo uh, uh, of, uh, of a reflecting uh, uh, surface. We generally characterize, uh, again, doing a general relativistic or, or comparison against calibration models, we generally characterize our, uh, uh, our, our uncertainty in terms of this delta parameter, which is a kind of a deviation from Kerr geometry. Uh, and that has an, you know, it's a kind of a 10% type of uh, type of constraint uh, shown here in the in the red uh, using a, a, a number of different uh, assumptions. 
it's essentially comparable to uh, to the measurement that we obtained uh, on uh, for M87, um, but uh, uh, you know this is something that we expect that uh, with future experiments we can uh, continue to uh, improve uh, upon this. Um, we look specifically at some non-GR models, and so here are some ray tracings that. We did uh, of, of some of these more exotic uh, um, um, gravity schemes and also more exotic uh, objects, things such as boson stars, uh, dilatons, wormholes, and, uh, and we're able to place some constraints, parameterized constraints on some of these models. Those constraints uh, tend to have look something like this where uh, with, in, in comparison against the Keck and VLT measurements, uh, against certain parameters, we're able to, uh, to constrain some of these models. The, the allowed space is, is the non-shaded uh, space. Okay, uh, just a couple more minutes here to say, talk a bit about what's next for the EHT. Um, this is our image of the, the polarization structure around M87 we're working on, which, which provides constraints on the magnetosphere uh, of, of M87, where we're, we have that uh, uh, data on Sag A star, and we're working on that. Um, the the long time scale behavior of these systems is a very interesting probe, first off, just of a demonstration that, that, that these measurements are uh, are not a are not a fluke uh, of of some you know uh, unusual geometry, um, and uh, they also allow us to probe accretion flows. This is a result that we had using some of the, the very early uh, proto EHT measurements on M eighty seven that show a consistency in the ring diameter over time, um, and we we expect to be able to do that with uh, Sag A star. Uh, in going into the future with the many data sets that we already have. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but I just want to make clear we have data sets from 2018, 21, 22. Uh, we observe in annual campaigns. So next year, we, uh, we hope to do 345 gigahertz observations, higher frequency, higher angular resolution. And then beyond that, we're looking at making movies. Uh, of M87 doing longer timescale campaigns over hundreds of days or a hundred days and watching uh, that system evolve. And of course, there's a, the potential for uh, doing dynamics on Sag A star on timescales of tens of minutes or, uh, or hours uh, uh, in some of this uh, existing data and exploring that in more detail. Um, there's a, there's a whole next generation of, uh, of, of future uh, technologies and new stations and new techniques uh, going, uh, populating other sites on the ground um, and, uh, and even going into space that really opens up uh, a number of really exciting uh, uh, directions. Uh, and we're quite excited about, uh, about all of those uh, opportunities going into the future. So let me end here. Um, the, uh, you know, what's the fundamental story here? Black holes power active galactic nuclei. I think that's a really fundamental result from these, uh, from the results on M87 and Sag A star. Sitting at the base of these giant jets and sitting at, uh, uh, in the quiescent nuclei of, 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 of an ordinary galaxy, there is a black hole. Um, we're able to use our observations to test general relativity and black hole physics uh, over three orders of magnitude in black hole mass. And we're also able to make comparisons against the LIGO tests that are eight orders of magnitude different uh, in, in mass. And we're making precision measurements of accretion and jet physics. There's a huge amount to do in the future. Uh, we're really just uh, beginning to, to get started on this. Um, 
And so stay tuned. We have lots of great results uh, to come. So with that, I'll, I'll end and uh, I'll take some questions. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Jeff, for the really nice talk. Uh, we can take a few questions now. So if you have a question, raise your hand and I can call on you. Uh, Catherine. Yeah, I wondered, are the three bright, the three brightest parts of the ring, three separate parts of the accretion disk or can it be one bright structure that's lensed? So don't believe those knots. Uh, they are, um, uh, we make no claims about uh, about the reality uh, of uh, of those of those features uh, in the ring, so they they really are, uh, we believe, uh, artifacts uh, of the uh, 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 of the imaging that and and we we see those you know we do extensive synthetic tests and we see these kinds of features appearing in the data. Um, we have less confidence in the in the ring structure. Or in the in the the details of the ring structure than M87, as a result of the uh, uh, of of the of the rapid dynamics uh, of uh, of Sag A star, um, and so yeah, there uh, you know we we really think that you know there are an ensemble of images that are a good representation of this data set, and this is one of them. It's not unique. Thanks. Any other questions, uh, Shri? Uh, Jeff, um, I just uh, the fundamental uh, measure or, me or inference, of which I agree with you, uh, has to be always made uh, with black holes. Uh, uh, with with this uh, the galactic center is that you, you showed in a somewhat you know combination of basic theory and your data that it doesn't have a surface. And I think it's an important thing to uh, not assume. Uh, mm -hmm. There are many other lines of evidence showing black holes don't have surfaces, including the absence of type one bursts in stellar black holes, for, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so that part I get very well, um, but I'm unable to grasp what fun, uh, and of course the other part I get is, there's a known distance, there's a known mass done through orbital dynamics. <clears throat> and now you do gravitational ray tracing and some expectations, and it's roughly sort of shows our ideas of light bending and so on are reasonable. Mm -hmm. But beyond this, I'm unable to grasp what genuine insight does this put these images show right now? Hmm. Uh, partly because I have an absolute allergy to MHT models. You know, there are <laughs> things we put in, yeah, they're all fine, but I don't think anyone in your team would be willing to bet a year of their salary against any MHT model. So you can't compare observations to MHT models and declare victory. Um. Right. Well, I won't. I won't speak for what, how gambling uh, my my colleagues are uh, on 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 GRMHD, but I uh, I think you know it is a it's a remarkable result that that none of those models um, uh, you know stand up to uh, stand up to all of the data. Uh, but I think you don't you don't have to you don't have to be faithful to to GRMHD to, um, uh, to uh, you know, to buy into the idea that really any reasonable physical model uh, is is going to uh, is going to give you a um, um, is is going to give you a uh, an emission profile that that peaks as it as it as it comes close in to the to the black hole and and so the you know the the breadth of those different kinds of models you know they they nearly all reproduce that 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 fundamental aspect uh, of you know that, that yeah, close so in there's there's emission close in and it leads to to lensing of 
of, of about the right uh, diameter. Yeah, no, that, that's what I said. The, the yeah. second part of what I, when I see an image like that, apart from the first one, of the lack of a surface, second one is, okay, the general bending ray optics, it, it works. Uh, and, uh, but I want to know, uh, what is the fund, what is the next real, uh, either qualitative that is, you know, or uh, let me say, not when I say qualitative, I mean, really amazing thing like lack of a surface, a surface, that's not qualitative, that's just mm -hmm. a, a leap. Okay, either in that category or in the exact category, when you talk of GR tests and so on in that diagram you showed, those are real tests. I mean, they're, I mean, you know, especially things in the pulsar world uh, and arguably now in the light of gravitational astronomy world with the, with the, you know, with the actual chirp signal. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, I'm not able to understand that these images are providing leaps of tests here. Mm -hmm. They look pretty. They are sort of, they're no surprises. Mm -hmm. But there's well, no precision I, there. So let me let me go back to you know some some of these. Um, no, um, no, no. Let, let's not waste time. None of these alternative theories. Okay, it's a thing that it's like a straw man. They are not even physical theories, so it doesn't matter. There's so many these theories fail in many other ways. So uh, I'm known to practically rant and rave, so I shouldn't do more than that. Uh, they are not theories. Uh, the only theory we have for gravity right now is classical theory of GR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, so you know, as you know, Sri, this is this is uh, this is not my area of expertise. Uh, but I would say that you know, in the in the longer term, what is you know the the what what these measurements show that. And, and demonstrate as a, as a real possibility for the future is that with higher angular resolution, you can, you can, in, uh, you can resolve these uh, successive nested photon rings that, that correspond to multiple wraps uh, of the uh, uh, of photon orbits around the black hole. Uh, and that uh, and that the precise measurement uh, of those geometries um, gets you uh, into the regime of being able to, uh, to measure spin uh, and do uh, you know, much stricter tests uh, of, of some of these uh, alternative models uh, than, than anything that, that you can achieve with, with in this regime. And it, it uh, it gets you out of the the astrophysical regime and into the uh, uh, into uh, uh, I think a more quantitative regime on 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 some of these questions. Okay, yeah, let's move on. Although I, I'll I'll make a comment that just because something's not surprising doesn't mean it's not exciting. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's my opinion. I think yeah. that uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Cameron. Um, great presentation and congratulations on the result. I just had a question about some of the movies that you were showing earlier, and forgive me if you already answered this during the presentation, but the variability and the, the features that are moving in those movies that are generated by the, the models, mm -hmm. um, are the timescales of those movies, uh, what are the timescales of the movies, and, and is the, the variability just due to the, the crossing time of the photons around the, the black hole um, itself and the ISCO, or is it something to do with the accretion disk rotation rate or something like that? Uh, so yeah, good, good question. So the, um, the, uh, we run uh, these simulations typically out to 10,000 times the, uh, uh, the, the the light crossing time and in some cases out to 30,000 and I believe in, in in at least one set of models we ran out to um, a hundred thousand times that time um, uh, that light crossing time for Sag a star is tens of seconds uh, and so this is you know going out in to regimes of uh, 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 I guess um, uh, days to, to weeks um, and uh, the variability that you're seeing, 
uh, is a result of um, uh, uh, is is a result of turbulence uh, in the uh, uh, in these structures, uh, magneto rotational instability, uh, and uh, um, you know the 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 accretion flow from an outer boundary into into this regime uh, is uh, you know is a is 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 turbulent, um, and uh, and there are there are occasionally um, magnetic flux eruptions that uh, that occur in these systems, which can produce uh, really dramatic uh, variations. Uh, so there's a kind of a wide range of, of different phenomena that are um, uh, that 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 go into that total variability, um, and lensing plays a role in it. Uh, that there are some correlations one expects to, to see uh, uh, with, with some of the light uh, uh, being, uh, being lensed. Uh, uh, so a, a wide variety of, of, of different uh, uh, mechanisms at play here. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Kunal? Hello. Thanks, Jeff, for the talk. Hi, Kunal. I have a quick question. Uh, do any of the EHT observations so far or those expected in the near future, would they be sensitive to uh, place any meaningful constraints on any of the outflows or like a low power jet, for example, that may exist within the system? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So um, in part, the conclusion that we are not seeing uh, an edge on system uh, is uh, is in part driven by the uh, uh, by by the fact that there 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 isn't a you know it's it's easier to hide a, an outflow if it's uh, if it's not directly in the plane of the of the sky, but as you can see it's a it's a pretty weak constraint. Um, we we absolutely think that. Um, with the improved capability of, of these measurements that we should be able to, um, we should be able to place uh, better constraints uh, on an outflow. In particular, the new stations that we have added uh, uh, start to fill in some of the shorter spacings, uh, which gives us more sensitivity to kind of larger scale structures where, Perhaps there's a there's a, a, a diffuse outflow. The models tell us that that there could be a really substantial amount of power going into an outflow, uh, but it's totally unseen uh, at this point. All right, thank you. And last question, Ranga. Uh, thank you for covering all that ground there. Um, my question was about the specifics of the measurement. Uh, two parts of that, one of which is how does the center of the position of the center of the, the shadow correspond to the dynamical center that you would derive from the stars at least. Um, mm. So what's the constraint on that? And what's the constraint on the spin axis compared to the galactic spin axis? So you said uh -huh. the constraint was weak, but how weak? Yeah, so we have, uh, almost no astrometric information in, in, um, in these data. Uh, the, uh, um, our, our calibration technique uh, essentially centroids uh, uh, everything at, a, at an arbitrary position. Uh, and so I, we, in terms of making a kind of a precision comparison against the uh, the, the infrared stellar uh, uh, components, uh, we um, um, we aren't able to we aren't able to do anything in a that that's that's very powerful. Um, sorry, what was your second question? Regarding the spin axis. So oh, the spin axis, you, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, this is the 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 um, the the broad conclusion here, right, is low inclination, so less than seventy degrees, uh, and uh, um, you know, and that inclination should be um, you know asso associated with the uh, 
with the spin axis. So it's a at, at this point, it's a it's I would say a very weak constraint. Um, uh, you know, we we really we we really can't say very much about it. Um, again, with you know higher quality images from a lot of the data that are that are in the can, that I think we we might be able to uh, to say something more precise in in the future. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, with that, uh, let's thank our speaker one last time. Um, and I guess we'll end there. Thank you, thank you again, Jeff. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, great to talk to all of you. Uh, I'm off to go meet uh, Vikram at the, at the bar here at the hotel. <laughs> See you, enjoy your drink. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, thanks again, bye, bye everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Bye.